the no-till growers, they only use herbicides to control uh, Russian thistles and the other weeds. The conventional growers, they can use tillage to control Russian thistle. In crop, they, not, they all use herbicides to control Russian thistle. The problem with Russian thistle is that it germinates um, later in the season, so it escapes to, to herbicides because it germinates after the time the growers can, can spray herbicides safely. Welcome to the Crop Science Podcast Show by WiseNetics. I'm your host today, Leo Bastos, Assistant Professor in Integrative Precision Agriculture at the University of Georgia. Today, we welcome our guest, Dr. Judith Barroso. She is an Associate Professor in Wheat Science at the Oregon State University. Judith, welcome to the Crop Science Podcast Show. It is great to have you here with us today. And to start things off, I want to ask if you could share with us your path and how you got to your position that you have today. How I started in, you know, as you, it's been a long story, but I will try to be as brief as possible. I started working for OSU in 2014. So this year in October will be 10 years. It goes super fast time these days. But before OSU, uh, well, I started to work as an assistant professor. Like four years ago, I promoted to associate professor. But before OSU, I was working as a postdoc at the Montana State University for four years, since 2010 until 2014. And you notice my accent is because I am not originally from, from the US. I am originally from Spain. It's over there where I did my PhD. And during my PhD, I had the opportunity to travel to the US, uh, to Montana State University. And that is how I, I guess I got in love to this country and I came here to do a postdoc. And then I wasn't thinking in staying this long, but uh, life, you don't know how it goes sometimes. So I'm here. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy how how time goes by super fast. Yeah, I've been I've been in the US myself for thirteen or fourteen years at this at this time, and it's crazy. Like it's yeah. Um, well, so I guess to follow up with that, can you can you share with us a little bit of what you are currently working with? Definitely. So um, I have several projects going on. This, how I, well, I, I work here at a research station, Liar Pendleton is North Inster, Oregon. Here, Grower says that there is a wheat country, so it's mostly 90% of the crop land is wheat. So I work on dry land wheat, and the most problematic weeds in wheat are the annual, um, the winter annuals, like Downy Brom, although growers refers to that one as cheatgrass as well. Um, so I have a big uh, research on, on cheatgrass. I would I prefer to call it downy brown, but yeah, sometimes uh, common names are kind of confusing. Um, that the wheat has become resistant to all the herbicides grower can use in wheat. So it's very tricky to control that wheat with chemical control, with herbicide, I mean, herbicides, I mean. Uh, another project that I have Many growers here in this region are no-till growers, so rely only on herbicides to control weeds. And like I mentioned, weeds uh, have become uh, resistant to many of the products they can uh, use. So I am, one of my big research is to see how uh, no-till growers can use occasional or strategic tillage to to control herbicide resistant weeds without causing soil erosion or problems to the soil. So that is a big uh, project that I have right now. I work also a little bit on, on cover crops. Um, particularly, I am doing a project on intercropping. Uh, what else? Um, well, I, uh, I have a project on, on Russian thistle to try to help um, 
growers with uh, that uh, problem that is is uh, is very important in this region. Um, I am not sure if I am forgetting something. Well, I am also working with the precision sprayers to see how much. Um, yeah, many herbicide labels are not ready for this spot spraying um, practice. So I am uh, working with one uh, precision sprayer and see how we can help those industry companies to make the, the labels more adapted to, to this type of uh, applications. Awesome. It's, it's really... It's it's really great to see that the breadth uh, that your program is 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 studying and researching on, and um, I do I do I do want to go a little bit deeper in one of those topics. So you mentioned here Russian thistle to be an important weed uh, in the region. So can you tell us a little bit a little bit more about that weed in specific and why is it such a problematic weed? Thank you. Well, that is a good question and. I don't know if I know why it's such a problematic weed here. <sighs> and it's not in other regions. Definitely, it's, it's, it's more of a problem in that part of this region where the winter wheat fallow rotation is established. In annual cropping, it's a problem, but there are many others. In the winter wheat fallow rotation, is the most predominant broadleaf weed problem. Why? I guess that weed is very well adapted to drought. Uh, when, for example, the, the, the soil is dry for, a, for the wheat plant, the crop plant is still wet for the uh, Russian thistle. Russian thistle um, can take much more water from the soil than, than the wheat. So, um, yeah, Russian thistle has a huge water use efficiency. Soils that are dry for many other species, they, 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 they still have water for Russian thistle. It has a very negative water potential, that species. So very well adapted to drought. Then this region is very windy. I, the system, the way how Russian thistle disperses the seeds is by tumbling. Many growers know that weed uh, as tumble weed. So um, being this region windy, I guess, is also favor the, the dispersion of this, the spread of this weed. So I believe I would say that are the two reasons, high drought to tolerance and the way the, the species disperses the seeds that being a lot of fallow in the area, it can run miles and miles and disperses the seeds. Perfect. And just, uh, you know, so myself, not being from the U.S., but I do remember growing up, you know, watching cartoons and movies uh, about the, you know, the, the Western movies and cartoons related to that theme and seeing that that weed rolling on the dirt roads and kind of accumulating against fences that is what russian thistle is is that correct is that that that's the depiction of it i guess yeah there are several species of tumbleweeds but here in this region the most predominant like if you see a, a weed tumbling or rolling uh, 90 percent sure it will be like 90 percent of those uh, skeletons are, are russian thistle for sure they are the ones that are more rounded in shape. There are other tumbleweeds like cochia or, or tumble master or tumble pigweed. There are several species of tumbleweeds, but the most predominant, the, yeah, I guess, yeah, is Russian thistle. Perfect. Yeah. Just to, just to kind of, you know, at least for those that have not seen it, maybe maybe that that analogy can help uh, picture what, what that looks like. Yeah, although I learned recently, although I learned in through uh, from internet, I am not sure how I need to 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 check that information. That the Western movies, I guess, uh, Russian thistle started in the came to the USA. It started in South Dakota. Uh, it came in some grain flash flag, flax grain from Russia. Uh, in in the, 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 the internet says 18, 18, 18, 1870s. So I guess, and then it takes time for, for to come here to the West. So 
So I guess it's all about perception. I don't know if he, if those movies are right. You know, maybe That's that true. it wasn't there. I mean, it's all about perception. Yeah. It make, you know, the, the Western movies, we identify Western movies with that uh, Russ and Thistle rolling, but it might come later than those times. So it's, it's interesting. I learned that. I, I am yeah, I am not sure if uh, or what is the time of the Western movies. I think a little bit earlier than 1870s. And even though it could be that time, it takes a while for, for the Russ and Thistle to come to the West. It has to move across the, the the Rocky Mountains. So I guess it's the railroad who brought it here, but... That's, that's a good point, is is the, the timing of the, the weed and also how, where, when the movies are, are occurring. But that's, yeah. yeah, maybe it was a different tumbleweed. <laughs> I'm not sure, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I know in California there is a different tumbleweed. It's a kind of a giant rust and thistle. It's called rust and thistle, but it's a different species. But I don't know here in the West... Mm, it's all like it's the same species. It can be very uh, different morphology, more different morphological shape, but it's the same species. So I am not sure. But no, sorry, sorry for the interruption. No, no, no. That's great. That's great. And uh, you know, so so you 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 mentioned that Russian thistle it has a high water use efficiency, so it's very competitive in pulling water from the soil, especially against you know, some of the row crops grown in the region and dispersed by wind and you are in the windy region. So that seems like it's all the ingredients needed for, for some problem, right? Yeah. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how are growers managing it? What What is the strategy to manage or maybe, you know, perhaps not 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 just how to manage it, its growth, but maybe even its dispersion through wind. What are growers, growers in that region doing to control it? So I mentioned that the no-till growers, they only use herbicides to control uh, Russian thistles and the other weeds. The conventional growers, they can use tillage to control Russian thistle. In crop, they, not, they all use herbicides to control Russian thistle. The problem with Russian thistle is that it germinates um, later in the season, so it escapes to, to herbicides because it germinates after the time the growers can can spray herbicides safely. But how growers are controlling uh, the Russian thistle in the region, <sighs> that's a good question. I would say mostly with he uh, herbicides. Um, the problem is that it escapes during the crop season, it germinates late, so it escapes to the herbicides, most of the plant, and then at harvest, when it doesn't have any competition, it really take off and is when it put the seeds and take a lot of water. And at that time, the plants are very big. So growers that are trying to kill it with or control it with glyphos, uh, sorry, with herbicides, they have a hard time those herbicides to work at that time because the plants are big and the weather doesn't uh, cooperate if either, if either because it's dry and the temperatures are not right to make the herbicides work. So it's a tough weed and, and, and it's a very expensive application post-harvest. And I, I don't know if probably, you know, I am talking about wheat farmers, so they don't have a huge margin of benefit. So that is the reason I am... I have this research on cooperative Russian thistle management because I think we we really need to work as a, they, the growers need to work as a team because what one does affect the other. So um, I'm trying to prove that if we they work together, they can um, control uh, Russian thistle better. Yeah, that, that, that was great. And and I do want to follow up with that because you mentioned the Russian thistle cooperative management. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that and what does it mean? Like what are growers doing to, to help each other to, to fight this week? To make, to try to put an example for people to understand is like, for example, in the fall, when you have your uh, fallen leaves, you rake your leaves, but if your neighbor doesn't rake their leaves, eventually you probably will get 
the your yard again with the leaves on your neighbor because of the wind. So with the Russian thistle, it's kind of the same. If if a grower, a grower, for example, can control his fields good uh, for Russian thistle, but the problem if if their neighboring fields some of their neighbor doesn't control the Russian thistle, that species uh, naturally the main stem will break at the base and get loose. And when the when with windy days, it will roll over their fields and get reinfested again. So the the idea is to have all the growers in a community to work together to control the, the Russian thistle, to reduce the infestation in the region and also reduce the, the costs for everyone. And I understand that like if grower says that they don't have the the economy the 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 money to, to do the, the, the post harvest application is 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 fine as long as for example they mow those Russian thistle before September that is when that species um, set the, the viable seeds or produce the viable seeds that would be fine because I mean they will they will have the you they will prevent that species to produce seeds it's not they won't prevent that is for, for that species to take water from their fields but at least they don't they won't Mm, cause problems to their neighbors. Yes, yes, absolutely. And and just so we understand better as well, is that something that, like, is it something that growers are organized around, like, co-ops, or is it more like local growers around that are neighboring, that have neighboring fields are organizing in that way? How does that, I guess, organization of growers happen to 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 do this this type of management? Yeah, thank you for the question and helping me to clarify my, my answer because it's not something that is established. It's a pilot project. We are working with eight growers that we have identified uh, fields from them together. So they have uh, committed to control the Russian thistle uh, very well. They have committed to leave a maximum of one plant of Russian thistle per acre. So they are going to they are doing an excellent job in a particular area, what we call cooperative area. And this this same group of growers, they have a fields that they also outside of these cooperative areas, they have fields that they are going to do an excellent uh, Russian thistle control as well. But um, our hypothesis is that those fields outside of the cooperative areas are going to have higher Russian thistle pressure from neighboring fields. So the project is trying to, to see if uh, from those um, uh, fields that are together, I think I don't I think they are about like 12 fields together. Here we are talking about big fields. If the control in, the, in that cooperative area, if we see reduction of Russian thistle infestation and also reduction in costs to control the infestation, and uh, see if in those uh, 12 fields that we have identified outside of the cooperative area uh, is uh, the infestations are higher and more expensive to control. And we are in the third year and so far we are seeing an $18 per acre reduction uh, working cooperatively in fallow fields. So, so far so good, but it's very preliminary results. And, and like you are saying, we are trying to work with NRCS Natural. Uh, I am not sure if I'm going to uh, um, NRCS Natural Resources Conservation Services. I am not sure if I am right with the with the acronym, but we are working with that um, USDA agency to to see how we can if we once the project is is finished, if how we can increase the the area and how we can. Uh, include more growers in, in, in the area and committed those growers to, to control cooperatively the, the Russian thistle. But we haven't had, we don't have anything in place yet. It's just a, a kind of a pilot project we are doing with eight growers. Perfect. Thanks for, for, for expanding on that. And this is really, you know, except as you were explaining, I was thinking here about how, like, what is the control? How are you, or the control as far as, you know, they have a treatment and they have a control that you're comparing to. 
And then when I explain that they do have other fields, they're also managing well, but they're not neighboring fields to growers that are also in the program, right? So that was, that's a really, it's a really smart, it's my way of testing it. And, and I mean, you know, these own farm studies, especially large fields have so much variability of so many different factors. And, and even though that is happening, you can, you can still see $18 per acre reduction in costs for weed control. That's, that's a, it's a fantastic result. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, we are very excited and we are trying to yeah to to learn about natural boundaries that you know we have tried different fences but this Russian thistle uh we cannot stop it with fences um so we are trying to see if we can figure out some uh, natural uh, boundaries like maybe canyons or something that uh, help us to identify cooperative areas that we think it can work the the control and as you were saying, like wheat growers, you know, I mean, I guess every grower, but but wheat growers perhaps even more to a larger extent have have very small margins, right? So if you're saving eighteen dollars per acre just by working together, that's that's a great it's a great result right there. Awesome. Well, I guess uh, before we move to our last three questions, is there anything else that you'd like to share about this wheat specifically, or or perhaps about another topic? on your program that we have not covered today? I think we be, I've been talking about the strengths of this Russian thistle, you know, high uh, water use efficiency. It is very prolific. Each plant produces a lot of seeds. Uh, the seed dispersion, this species know, knows how to <laughs> disperse the seeds. But I would like to mention a, um, a couple of, or maybe one weakness that I can think of. The the, one of the reasons we think cooperatively can work as well is because this species, the seed longevity is very low. Most of the seeds, they just last one year. So that is the reason we think cooperatively, sorry, cooperative management can be a way to reduce the infestations. And I mentioned the, the dollar savings, but the, the, the infestation reduction is, is even more important than, than the, well, I mean, for the growers, it's very important the economics, but well, the most important. But it's also very important to reduce the infestation. So every year, the the cost to reduce the Russian thistle is lower, lower, and lower. So very important to reduce the infestations as well. And the low seed longevity of these uh, uh, seeds, uh, I would like to mention that because it's one of the weaknesses of of Russian thistle. Um, it's also a species very. Um, susceptible to competition. So for those growers, uh, for me, the second big tool to control Russian thistle is to have a good uh, crop, very well established crop that will be a, a good hammer to control Russian thistle. It's very susceptible to competition. Uh, that is the reason in the Western movies coming back, like, uh, yeah, I don't believe when undisturbed land is in, for Russian thistle won't thrive. He needs that species life disturbances. So... Yeah, I am is skeptical about the, the Western movies. I love to see the Russian thistle in the Western movies. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. It's time for our famous three. All right. Well, um, you know, wanna wanna say to those listening to us or maybe watching us uh, as well, if you're enjoying this episode, if you're learning like I am uh, with Dr. Judith Barroso about Russian thistle management, um, Make sure to to like this episode, like the the our podcast, um, subscribe if you want to receive more great material like this uh, in the future, and also make sure to share with anyone else you think may benefit from from learning about this topic. All right, so uh, now we're headed towards the last three questions of our episode. We ask every guest these three questions, and it's been a blast for me to be learning. Uh, especially, well, to learn throughout the entire episode, but really get into these three questions that we ask everyone and we get a chance of seeing, you know, how different people um, suggestions are changing or even being the same across them. So the first question here is, what is your favorite agricultural related resource? This could be a book, it could be a movie, it could be a blog post, it could really be anything, uh, but it's more of a resource related to your uh, technical expertise, you know, so a resource in that area that you would like to share with our audience. 
I am not sure I have one specific one. Um, well, here I like the um, the website of Washington State University. I'm sorry, I am I am <laughs> favoring my. I, I guess I am. <laughs> I like my colleagues from Washington State University. Yeah, they have. I don't know how it's called that website. Um, a small a small grain website. Uh, the the Washington State University. They have a very um, Web, web, a very good website that is, 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 is very... Sometimes, you know, I get questions. I, wo I work on dry land, but sometimes they, I receive questions from many other fields like aquatic weeds or rangeland weeds. So, yeah, that, that website is, for me, is very useful sometimes to, to know about those answers. Another website I use a lot, and this time is... Um, the, lead, the management, the manager, sorry, of that website is Oregon State University. So that website is the Pacific Northwest uh, um, Handbook, particularly the the weed uh, chapter or the weed book, uh, Pacific Northwest Handbook. That is a, a good website. Like for example, if I receive questions about which herbicide can I use to control this weed, weed, yeah, that is the perfect website to to get the answer to those uh, questions. Um, well, we have a new website. It's called Pacific Northwest Herbicide Resistance Initiative org, and hopefully, well, it's live now, and hopefully, we can put over there uh, useful information for growers and everyone we they want to know uh, more about the research going on on the Pacific Northwest. Perfect, and and I just want to make a quick hook here. So we, it's it's really interesting because. Many of our guests on this question, they mentioned something related to extension, right? And I believe these resources you're sharing are also extension related, right? And yeah, so so just to make a quick hook here that the extension system in the U.S. works very well. It works for the growers. It has, it takes all of our research complex ideas that we discover and package that in a very simple way. Uh, that growers, and not just growers, but really any the general public to have access to something that is science-based, but also not too complex, not full of jargon like our papers may be. So it's just another another point on our database here that how extension is really playing an important role uh, for, for the audience. Perfect. Um, all right. So now shifting to our second question is... Uh, what is your favorite resource? And again, could be a book, could be a movie, could be a website, or really anything uh, that you'd like to share, but outside of the technical expertise. So outside of weeds and agronomy and soils, perhaps something related to soft skills or, or something along those lines. One book that I read every maybe five years is... Although I don't remember the author and I don't have it here, I have it at home. It's called Crucial Conversations. Uh, I feel very useful in life, not just for for work. It's, it's also to for personal relationship with others. You know, well, I work. I use it for work because I am a supervisor, so I need to manage different employees. So and each person is different. So Crucial Conversation. Is a book that gives you good guidance about how to communicate with others, to be friendly and approachable and supportive of everyone. So I like that book. Nice, nice. Thanks for sharing that. I took note here. But I don't remember the author, but I'm 100% sure that the title is Crucial Conversations. Nice, nice. Thanks for sharing that. I took note of it and I added, I'm going to add it to my list of books to read. As as a you know, as an assistant professor, I definitely have a lot of a lot of people management skills still to be to be learned and <laughs> and perfected, if possible. So yeah, that that's th those are yeah, managing people is yeah, it's one of those things that we don't really learn how to do while we're going through grad school and kind of learn as you go and, and through resources like this. So thanks for sharing. All right, so our last question is, in your opinion, what are the skills or skill sets 
that successful professionals have that set them apart from others. Coming back to talking about good managers for me is um, people oriented. People that are people oriented, they are generous, they are approachable. For me, the I think those skills are what makes people more successful. It is true that if you are a good communicator, you open yourself windows or doors, but then the day to day is nice to have around colleagues or supervisors that are uh, people oriented. They are generous, not just thinking about themselves. So that's for me are the, the qualities I appreciate the most. And also in, in students or, or workers, I, I, I like to see generous people, not people just thinking in themselves all the time. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for sharing those. Um, and, and really for our conversation today, I really enjoyed learning a lot about, and, you know, especially today about Russian, Russian thistle it's a weed that I'm not particularly, um, I don't really have experience with it, uh, you know, and it's really, really great to hear about the, the history, the management, some of the challenges, and also some of the amazing work you're doing to combat that with the management, with the cooperative management. That was a, it's a really interesting project. And, um, you know, looking forward to, to learn more of what, what you all learn as you progress in this in this project. It sounds really exciting. So Judith, thank you so much again for being with us today. I appreciate our talk and it was great having you in the podcast. Thank you so much, Leo. It was a pleasure to talk to you this morning or afternoon. Absolutely, thank you.